Monday. It's my video uh, every Monday. I hope you enjoy uh, the various topics that I talk on. Uh, today, I am going to talk to you um, really about the questions that were raised uh, on my webinar that I did on Saturday morning about the buy, refurb and refinance strategy. So um, as I went through, it was a two hour um, call that I did, there were quite a few people on there and I talked about how to do it and lots of content, uh, also case studies so you could see how it actually works and some testimonials of people who have, uh, who have done it through the training that I've done. So look, um, very importantly, you know, afterwards what I've done is I've printed out loads and loads of questions that, um, that were asked. So really what I've done is I've been through the questions and I've highlighted, I've written them on my board here, uh, four questions really. And I thought just for you know, a few minutes, I'll go through that, I'll answer those questions. And then, um, you know, that's really the video for today because I think that would be something nice to tie into what's current, what's going on in, in the market and where people are thinking to um, move forward, whether using auctions or especially with buy, refurb, refinance. So it was interesting. Why for? Look, many of the questions were actually run down to, uh, and answered by some people on the call. Martin Smedley, my mortgage broker, was on there as well. He answered some of them. Uh, he did answer one, which I'm going to go over again. And I am also, uh, you know, there's many other things, uh, people, you know, commenting, saying, it's brilliant. you know, Wednesdays are brilliant. They've done my training and they really enjoyed it and they recommend it and things like that. So the four key questions. All right. First of all, a lady called Kay. Yeah, if you're watching, welcome and thank you for coming on the webinar. But you asked, um, overseas investors, how do they do their due diligence on properties in the UK? Now, listen, that's a great question. Um, let's just backtrack a little bit. Obviously, anyone who's bringing in money into the UK, they've got to go through all of the, um, you know, the anti-money laundering um, checks. So let's just dispel one thing. Anyone bringing money over, whether it's a joint venture or they're going to be do, you know, paying you a sourcing fee, please don't take it in your bank account. Make sure that gets put, to, put into a solicitor's bank account and the checks are done before you receive it. You do not want HMRC or someone else coming after you um, because suddenly money is coming in from abroad. So be very careful with that. That's a word of warning. But secondly, how do they do their due diligence? Well, listen, that's a very hard one. Um, look, I am a, a busy person, but I was actually thinking at this time to um, almost offer, you, you tell me if you think it's something you would like, but offer, uh, it would be a paid service, but for me to do the DD on properties that you're looking at. So if you're looking at a property, um, it might be something that you know you could send with whatever information that you've got and I can run it through I can look at it and give you an honest opinion and work the numbers out maybe a little bit better and give you an appraisal back and so you can see and especially for an overseas um, uh, investor and that would be something that they would have to pay for um, I, I haven't even thought what the, the cost would be it depends I think scaling on what it would be because uh, you know <laughs> it's not one price fits all. <laughs> Imagine someone says, look, I want to build, um, you know, 50 houses here and uh, there's uh, 50 quid or whatever it's going to be. So it would be a, a scale. But look, if you would be interested in that service, then contact me, email me, and uh, we can have a chat, depending on what uh, what you're looking at. The how do, they, how do they do due diligence? Well, look, they've got to look at sold prices in the area. They have to and see what's doing. They have to speak to people. It is about location. You will never get away from location. And that's the, the thing I think is one of the hardest to find out because you can do your DD, um, due diligence is DD by the way. You can do that, but without knowing the, the actual area, um, the reality of it, of what's coming, what's going, um, the the employment, whether you know companies are going bust, whether they're expanding, all these things factors come into um, the equation 
of your due diligence because you want to know what's going to affect it. For instance, look, some people got burnt where I live. There is a place called um, uh, West uh, West End, all right? They call it, and they had lovely houses, and they were all being people were buying them up and doing student HMOs. Okay, we're within three quarters of a mile. Um, there was a block built, a big block um, built, a signet house was built, and it took all of the students from that road. So where people were buying properties, fairly expensive, and then investing and making them purpose-built then, um, HMOs, suddenly they had no market. So they were actually selling them. To get out, you had to sell them on less than they actually bought them, forget the works that they'd done on. So it was, you've got to understand. So it's not easy. Um, okay, it's a great question, but it's, it's a question that you've got to do quite a bit of work on it. Your part two of that question is how do I do my due diligence on sources? Well, you know, again, if there was a service somewhere that you could take a property and quite often I can, with a, with a sourcer, I know within, you know, not a lot of work, if it's uh, a good one or not. Um, a guy I was working with, he bought a, he was sent a, a deal, okay, and this was in the Midlands or, or higher up, I can't remember exactly where it was. He was in London, the guy very clever at selling, and some of these sources are fantastic at selling them, so they put all the great numbers up, then they put scarcity, so they're going to push you and push you and say, listen, there's someone else interested. He actually stopped the car, my friend, and paid whatever it was, £8,000 holding fee straight. There's my car, bang, 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 keep it for me. I'll come and have a look at it at the weekend. Now, he went up, travelled all the way up, said to me, Trevor, I've got it. And when he gave it to me, I did my DD on it and I, and I blew it out of the water. He still went up to have a look, but he questioned him. He said, how have you worked it, the value of this? So I think they valued it at something like, I don't know, rough numbers, 200,000. It was a 130,000 pound property, but they valued it on the commercial valuation. And he said, this is rubbish. It will never be worth 200,000 pounds in this street, never. He got his money back, but it's a wasted trip. So again, you know, he probably spent the best part of 200 pounds going up and coming back down. and a day's work where he earns a lot of money uh, on a day. So it probably cost him more than a thousand pounds in time and money. Um, it's a difficult one, but you've got to get to people uh, who know what they're doing and know how to do due diligence. Um, I've had many, many occasions, even some of my students that go and they look, you know, they get sent stuff by sources and they say, Trevor, what do you think of this? And I do my DD and I can say that in all of them, let's take a hundred, there's been two, which I think I've said, yeah, yeah, they look all right. Just go and, you know, get the survey done. Let's have a look at that. And away you go. But two out of a hundred. So, you know, it's a difficult one. If you want some kind of service, it'd be great. You know, you viewers, would you want a service that you could find a house and you could give it to someone for them to do a DD so you would um, be able to find out? question for you uh, and look put your comments down love you to actually tell me what you want me to talk about etc all sorts um, Ian Ian went on he said look he lives in a, um, a house in uh, London I believe quite a big house what he wants to do is to extend out the house can he do this can he extend out the back he live in the back whether a, a house or a, a a flat or whatever it's going to be and then rent the existing house as an HMO okay it's a great question and really not you not the first one to do this you know this is quite something you know a lot of people would do this because they're on hand for maintenance they're on hand for looking after the place uh, etc and to be fair it can be your pension and I don't know how old you are but it could be a great idea you find you can borrow the finance at pretty much 100% less fees and if you get it done, uh, providing you've got the value, the value, um, the loan to value, you know, enough equity in the property, should I say. But can you do it? Okay. Um, Martin did answer a little bit. He said, yes, you can. You do restrict to the amount of lenders who would take that on for you. 
plus the area that you live in must be less 40% or less than, than the rest of the building, which I don't think is a problem with what you were saying. So you've got to think of that. So if it's an initial 2,000 uh, foot house and you build your own bit attached to it, then 40% is 800 foot. So if you're going from 2,000 and now 40% is 800 feet, you happen to be living in that smaller space. So this is the thing, you need to get this right from the very beginning. But let's just look at something else. And although you so said Martin answered that and there's lenders and you can go, go to Martin, he's a specialist in that, no problem. But I wanted to bring in a little bit more. That's why I'm going over this question that Martin has answered. And the point here is harassment. Okay, you've got to be very, very careful. The laws around tenants rights and the peaceful uh, enjoyment life enjoyment of, of a peaceful life living in that property is paramount so you might if you're living on the, in the same vicinity as that property next to it and you might you know initially it's all fun and games everyone yeah that's nice and that's nice but let's suppose they start taking music or, or misbehaving or making a mess or something you guys are Sorry, can you turn that down? No, sorry, mate, you turn that down. You can't do this, you can't do that. You're a very sticky wicket because being the owner, you can't. You And you can't even enter the property without a written notice 24 hours. Get this wrong, and I know that there is a landlord fined 90,000 pounds harassment, and that money went to the tenants. So it's a word of warning. I mean, whether you live there or not, you still have to do written um, 24 hour written notice, just because you own it doesn't give you a right to walk in at any time. So be very, very careful in that circumstance. And my advice is do not become pally with your tenants. All right? I, I talk from experience, trust me, um, do not become pally, become just purely professional. You've got your own circle of friends. Do not make your tenants your close friends, all right? Uh, so that's that one. Um, Ian, um, sorry, that wasn't Ian's question. That was KC's question. Sorry, that was KC's question. I jumped to question. The question that Ian asked is a general house refurb uh, or schedule of work. Sorry, Ian, um, I'll get that right now. So Ian said, when you're doing a general refurb on a house, should you use a JCT? A joint contract tribunal contract. No, is the answer, and Ian. Uh, a JCT is used on big construction. So, look, when I teach my buy refurb refinance, I, I show you, uh, I talk about JCT because that's where the contracts have all come down. Now, the, the JCT was created nearly a hundred years ago, I think 1938 or something like that. Um, and what it was to do was to say that if you employ a, a contractor, they're telling you they're going to do this. You're saying you're going to pay like this and you both have a very strong contract. So if the contractor doesn't do what they say, you don't have to pay them so much because you go to court and it's clear, very, very clear JCT, very strong contract. Plus it's a very big contract. You will never, you're never, unless you go into a building properties, I would suggest I don't know, it could be, uh, you know, I would suggest something like maybe 40 plus properties that you're, you're going to build, you're not going to even ever see a JCT. So what's the deri derivative of a JCT? There's many things. Um, would you, on a general refurb, I don't have any contracts. I don't do a, a contract with a, with a small refurb. If I'm actually doing the project management on a heavy refurb, I, again, I will subcontract and I will manage those, man manage those, and that's fun. Uh, something I've always done. Uh, I didn't, I took my hands away from it for a while, uh, but I quite enjoy it, uh, to be fair. And it, you know, because I was teaching, I went back and started to man manage. Uh, before that, I'd had people would do everything. Um, I really do enjoy the process. Plus, it gives me more ammunition to show you guys what I'm doing. Um, so you said, you know, should it be the JCT? Should it be schedule of works? No, schedule of works is what you want. So it's, I'm not saying don't have any contract. I don't actually have a signed contract. 
But when I get a, um, a quotation, okay, I want that clarified. So yes, I'll ask them for a schedule of works. If you need it for the lender, you need it to be quite concise. If you just need it for you, you need to identify what you what they're saying. So if you get a quotation that comes through, it says, uh, yeah, I'll supply and fit kitchen for you, or I'll fit only the kitchen for you, whichever it's gonna say, you want to just check. Okay, so what does that mean for the kitchen? Are you gonna, you're gonna put the tiles? You're gonna do the under lighting that I've asked for. You're gonna do the floor tiles, you're gonna level the floor. You're gonna do the doorway. You're gonna paint it, you're not gonna paint it. So you need to understand, because you know, a builder will say, yep, yeah, I'll do your, I'll sort your kitchen out and five grand, five bit, whatever, or 50 grand, just whatever it's gonna be. You need to go back and you need to detail it because look, builders quite often um, are not detailed people in when they're doing their emails. They, they, you know, imagine they need, they want to work with their hands. One of my sons is like this, all right, and uh, he's excellent. He's a perfectionist in what he does. But if he said, "Yep, yeah, I'll take care of that," I know that he would take all of it, do all of it. So you can then go back and say, "Does that mean you're going to uh, supply all of the kitchen, including the rails at the top, including the lighting underneath? You're going to put in all the tiles and finish it off, paint, change the architrave, and do the, sort the doors out? All of it? Is that what you're saying?" and they come back and they confirm it. Now, if there's any dispute, you now have it detailed from you with the schedule of works of what they've said they will do because you have now a track record. Why do you want contracts? Because if it's a dispute, you can go back and you can say, look guys, this is my contract to the judge. This is what Mr. Blogs the Builder said he would do. Here's the pictures and he hasn't done it. Judge was saying, Mr. Builder, I'm sorry, you owe Mr. Cutmore X, Y, Z pay. Done, okay? And so that's why you would have something like that. And that exchange of an email with your contractors is enough paper trail, don't always have to have it signed, is a paper trail that you have. So don't do it verbally ever. You do it, you confirm it all with your email and you will be the one to make it a little bit more detailed that you understand it and you ask them to respond to confirm. Don't let them say, oh yeah, by the way, your email, that's fine, I'll agree with that. No, can you just ping a response to it by email, please? I need that for my records. Okay, so that was that. So that was Ian. Sorry, getting things mixed up. Um, Vasco, last question. Um, let's see. Yeah. Yes, Vasco, he asked a question. So on my training, I showed uh, one of my students, Pakash, I showed that he bought a property in Liverpool, a three bed resi, and he turned it into a four bed HMO. So um, Vasco says, how do you know when you buy a three bed resi, you can turn it into a four bed ensuite HMO? Okay, good, good question. Um, so look, what I would do, I have, I don't know if I've got my pad here, but I, I have a large pad which I use um, all the time. Uh, and it is a graph pad. It's quite big, it, it really is about this big, it's a graph pad. But what I, what I want to do is when I'm buying it, and, you know, I've done the offer, I will go back and I will take the important measurements. I'm not doing, there should be a floor plan somewhere, depending how, how much I want to check. Look, the first thing is I go on to the EPC register and I see, uh, download the EPC, all right? If they, if the, remember you cannot sell a property and by the way, you cannot rent a property unless you have a current EPC. They do last for 10 years. But the EPC, which is Energy Performance Certificate, at the top right of it, there it, it tells you the internal square meterage. This is really, really important. Um, I want to know that. I also want to work out the internal areas myself, right, approximately. I won't do it really, really, you know, strongly. But I'm, you know, I might leave out the stairwell. But I want to know the rooms and what I can do. Once I put it on my graph. Okay, I know what I can work it out to. All right. Also, you know, I, I use architects. 
I can go to them and say, look, this is what I've, I've drawn out. Can you show me, and you have to pay for this service, show me what I can do. And it's by doing that, I can see what, how they mess it about. And they're so clever. You know, even they see things. Occasionally, I see things which I can't, and we can work it. But vice versa, they're very, very clever in what they do. But by working it out, you will be able to find out what the square footage is. And then, once you've got a blank piece of paper, and remember, remember Pakashi's uh, house, it was back to brickwork. And you've got a blank canvas. That's one of the reasons I showed my some of my development work is because I'm showing you that I build up from nothing. Once you get that blank canvas, I can turn that room into anything I want. So whether it is, um, you know, en suite, and you've got to think carefully, so you strip everything back, you've got to think about pipe work, about electrics, all of that goes into the planning stage, um, et cetera. And that's very much uh, in a lot of my training that I'm giving on the binary property finance. And it fits very nicely with the lease option training as well which I did that offer. Anyway, look, they were the questions that I wanted to um, really just get through and cover those. And so you could have uh, an understanding of uh, what real questions uh, are. And I'm happy to answer, uh, answer questions uh, and discuss uh, difficult things. I do like problems. I'm afraid to say that sounds really bad, but I'm a problem solver. And uh, I enjoy that. Listen, I, I hope you continue to stay safe. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Please uh, share, comment, um, subscribe, and let other people know. And on Wednesday nights, at 8 o'clock on Cash Row Freedom um, with Leslie Town and Trevor Cutmore, a Facebook group, we do live Q&As. So we'd love to see you on there. Take care. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye.